Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Andy Warfield. I'm one of the founders of Coho. Um, we've been uh, having uh, a lot of fun with this company for about two and a half years uh, now. We were originally called Convergent IO. Uh, we renamed the company uh, when we launched last year. Um, today is a, is a milestone for us um, in that, uh, as I'll get into in this talk, we, uh, we've just this morning announced uh, general availability of our first product. Um, so, hey. so, so we've been in pilots for, uh, for about a year uh, in one form or another. Uh, we've been in limited availability since uh, just after we launched uh, last, uh, last fall. Um, so I'm going to walk through um, a bunch of the architecture behind what we built. This, uh, this presentation um, is going to have progressively less structure as we go. Right, so I've, I've got some, some early slides that kind of talk about the product. I've got some slides that talk about a lot of the motivation <coughs> behind the product because there's some charts in there that, that make it a little bit easy to, to go through. Um, and then I'm basically, you know, slideless for the rest of the talk. So the only way that this is going to stay interesting is if you guys ask questions. Um, and I'm going to kind of try and take it in the direction that's interesting for you. So in terms of, of what um, Coho does, um, I, I want to start before I really get into this talking about a, a kind of weird customer conversation that, that I've been having a lot over the last year. There's this, this class of customer um, that, that's a little bit uh, surprising to me. Um, so I'm one of the guys that, uh, that wrote the Zen hypervisor. A lot of our team uh, comes out of a really strong virtualization background and we started looking at, uh, at storage a few years ago. I worked on storage for Zen when we were working on that, um, came through ZenSource and, and Citrix. Um, with Zen, a lot of the work we did, uh, in addition to the, to the, the, the sort of uh, commercial productization we did on Citrix's Zen server, uh, with open source Zen, we did a lot of work building up uh, the hosting providers, the public, public cloud providers that use Zen um, to build their data center environments. And so, you know, we did a lot of work building up um, large scale hypervisor deployments, um, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of VMs. And you know, we'd talk to the guys that ran those systems, uh, we'd work with them as they built them out, and we'd talk to a bunch of their customers. Over the last year, um, there's this class of customer that's, that's kind of unusual as an enterprise IT customer. They started in the cloud, right? So there's this class of app providing software company, right? Companies that are, that are offering web-based apps, and they started hosting stuff on Amazon, right, or on rack space or things like that and they were successful right they were successful they grew out right they started to have more and more vms and their bills monthly started to creep up and they hit this inflection point you know between one and two years of business if they're a successful company where they start looking at the amazon bills and the bills are like a hundred thousand dollars a month right two hundred thousand dollars a month and it starts to get into this range where they start going you know maybe there is a value right despite the volume discount <coughs> i'm getting in these deployments to pulling that into my own colo, right? To building a data center. So this is an enterprise, you know, proto enterprise IT admin that's never really run an enterprise IT environment before, right? They've always been hosted. And the expectations that they have are really weird, right? They, they come over, they start using VMware or OpenStack, right? They start building it out. And one of the points that ends up being really painful for them is storage. Right? Because the storage offerings that they have on the enterprise side are completely dissimilar to what they're used to in these hosted environments. Right? In these hosted environments, they buy storage on demand. Right? They pay by the gig. They pay by the utilization of storage. Right? They buy it as they need it. It's effectively an infinite amount of space. Right? Storage to them behaves a lot like virtualization does to the enterprise admin today. <laughs> Not like storage does to the enterprise admin today. Right? In the enterprise, storage is still very much a five-year purchase. Right? It's, it's a lot of data migrations and upgrades and stuff like that. And so this exact kind of use case is the sort of thing that, that predicated what we wanted to do with Coho. Right? We wanted to build an on-prem, scalable storage system that had the same kind of economics and the same kind of deployment experience as cloud-based storage. Right? So we're we're kind of packaging what is today a very service-oriented thing. So 
I'm going to spend a little bit just talking about product, and then I'm going to get into a bunch of architectural stuff because there's some there's some pretty technically interesting work in here. Um, so, you know, in a sentence, we provide performance dense, cost effective, and very scalable storage. Right. The idea is that you buy what you need now, and you grow it as you need it. Um, we're a software company, but we package and sell on top of hardware. Right. We use uh, commodity hardware. We basically go out on a yearly basis and look at what the right offering is uh, in terms of price performance. Uh, we've taken very aggressive use of PCIe Flash. Uh, we include a disk tier because we think it's crazy to put all your data on Flash. Um, and we scale that stuff out as you, as you go. Right? Um, and as we're virtualization guys, one of the, the, the really central things to the system is the fact that you should be managing your data and not the hardware that it's running on. So this is what our initial offering looks like. Right. This is a, a standard um, ODM style 2U box. It's got 12 3 terabyte drives in the back. Uh, it's two physical servers, redundant power supplies, four 10 gig ports. We serve NFS on this in the GA. We serve NFS v3 and we saturate um, in the base offering uh, all four 10 gig ports actively. Right? You can drive 40 gigabits off of a single IP address okay. on the system. Okay. No changes on the client side. The way that we do that, and I'll get into more details on this in a bit, <coughs> is we also include a 10 gigabit SDN switch in the product, right? So a way to think about us is that we are a converged offering, but we are not a compute storage converged offering. We are a network storage converged offering, okay? And I'm gonna argue that that's a much more sensible way to approach convergence. Um, I'll give you some really fast numbers, right? In that to you, 20 terabytes usable replicated data, 3.2 terabytes of PCIe flash, 40 gigabits of access bandwidth, 180K non-BS IOPS, right? This is 8020 full random 4K IO, right? Replication on the right path. And it just scales like that, right? So the idea is that you buy and deploy like this, you decide that you like it, and you scale up, right? You adjust your... Uh, your provisioning to match your needs. And at the end of the day, the system is designed so that all of your active data lives in Flash. And we'll work very hard to tell you when it doesn't. And you can grow the system in response to that. Right? So we're a Flash first storage system. Um, and, you know, cold data moves out to, uh, to disk as we go. Forbes is going to talk about how we do tiering uh, at the end of the presentation. You provide a, a single 10 gig switch? <coughs> uh, yes, we can do redundant. Um, and I'm, I'm looking for the customer that needs enough performance that we have to go past the two. Um, right, so we're, we're doing just, uh, just south of, uh, uh, oops, I might be missing a slide here. We're, we're just south of a million IOPS in five boxes. You right? I heard you say uh, NFS, and then I thought I heard you say SMB? Or was no, you didn't. Okay. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're, uh, we're GA'd um, today. Uh, this is a few of our, uh, um, of our, uh, our pilot customers that we've gone through. Um, uh, on the net office uh, and Overwatch have both been uh, incredibly supportive uh, last round pilots, right? They've taken our, uh, our limited availability pre-GA product, really put it through the paces, um, really been fantastic uh, in, terms of, in terms of feedback on what we're doing. Um, UBC has been a longer term pilot. Uh, there are a bunch of other pilots on this list that we can, uh, we can talk through. Um, very, very common characteristics of the customers that we're getting interest from are that they are medium to large uh, <coughs> virtualized environments. Uh, they're using IP-based storage and they're frustrated with performance, right? They're frustrated with the fact that, you know, the storage that they've been running for a long time hasn't been getting better as the technology underneath it has gotten better. Um, and because of the incremental deployment that we offer, right, they can take this on off cycle, they can vMotion stuff onto it, right, and they can progressively move more and more work onto it, right. So this five year refresh that, that people have been pushing for a long time is exactly the kind of thing that's going to undo those systems, right. Being able to move progressively off of them is a, is a really big deal, I think. Um, okay, so I think that's, that's really all I want to mention um, in terms of, you know, the, the really high-level GA announcement um, <coughs> and the, the product characteristics. Is there, is there anything that's not clear there? Right, I'll, I'll go into a whole bunch of gore now, um, but I just want to be, you know, really clear on, on what the offering looks like there. Okay. 
Um, so um, we need to talk about Flash, <laughs> right? So, so everybody's a geek here. Um, you know, everybody that looks at buying this stuff uh, is, is a geek and disks have sucked for a long time. Flash is awesome. Let's get lots of Flash, right? The latency is great. Let's go measure some latency. <laughs> it's really good. Um, when we started, um, we were, and this is around mid-2009, we started talking about ideas. We're doing really initial prototyping and stuff. And we got into the, uh, the initial round of the, uh, of the company. Um, we, we started um, building an entirely software virtual appliance-based storage system. Right? The, the premise of what we were looking at was that the server vendors were making pretty good margins off of disks. It was relatively difficult to buy a server without spinning disks in it, uh, but VMware wasn't taking advantage of those disks. Right? It was formatting them up and it was just leaving there uh, in the systems. And so why don't we build a storage system that takes advantage of those, right? unifies them, and, uh, and turns them into, uh, into an initially test and dev tier for storage. Right? This was around 2010. Um, and we went one step further and we said, with the money that you save on you know, whatever vendor you're using for, for SAN or NAS stuff, by moving your data onto that, why don't you take some of that money, and buy some flash, and stick it in your servers? Right? And so we started shopping this around. Um, we built a bunch of the system. We went and talked to Fusion IO. Um, Fusion had just released their, uh, their initial round of uh, PCIe flashcards. Um, we were really excited about, uh, um, about that stuff. We, we got a couple of demo cards and we took them back and we started using them inside the lab, right? Trying to make them work with the system. Um, and the first experience that we had with these cards was really interesting. Right? Fusion had a bunch of performance numbers that they were advertising on this card. We plugged them into our test boxes. We stuck them in, uh, in Linux and we started doing uh, load generation on them and we could not hit Fusion's numbers. Right? Now, I am not calling Fusion on their numbers. Their numbers were accurate, right? But the storage stack sitting above those numbers prevented us, right? This is the Linux block layer, basically, prevented us from saturating the card, right? So just that software, right? Just the software sitting in the OS, bare metal, talking to the card, prevented you from saturating the card. Card's very demanding, right? It's very, very performance dense. What's that to do with block size, Andy? No, no, we tuned all that stuff. Um, you know, so this is, uh, this is you know, at the elbow in the curve on block size, right? We're doing 4K requests down to the card. And what we ended up doing was, uh, was peeling away uh, layers. We ran a test, uh, test load generator at the driver. Uh, we were able to saturate it, right? We started peeling away layers above it, moving out a lot of the Linux block stack, and we were able to saturate it by moving up the stack. We spent about around six months basically building a data path, right, that, that would let us expose the the performance that the card had to offer, right? Um, and so, you know, that was a weird, a weird lesson, right? This flash is really, really different than disks, right? And it's not just that, wow, it's fast, I'm gonna stick it in all my machines, or I'm gonna replace all my storage with it. There are a couple of characteristics of this flash that you really need to wrap your head around. It's taken, you know, a lot of playing with it to, to figure out how to use it properly. <coughs> architecting for it is actually kind of challenging. Um, so, one problem with the flash, is that flash pricing is not like disk pricing. Okay, there's two reasons for this. Okay, I'm sure you've seen a slide like this in lots of talks, right? This is, this is basically an Intel 910. This is what we use in product, right? And this is a conservative, these are ballpark numbers, these are conservative. I can give you a workload that'll do close to 200K IOPS on this, but you know, let's kind of be reasonable, right? This is maybe generous to your average <laughs> enterprise drive in terms of IOPS. Um, right, 4,000 for that. 250 bucks for this. That one costs in the same ballpark as the server you are sticking it into, right? So you better be getting some money out of it. So now you do the thing that storage vendors always do, which is to go, this one, material cost is five bucks a gig. This one is 0.8 cents a gig, right? So this is a very clear reason not to stick all of your data there, right? No amount of compression and deduplication is ever going to make this make sense. Right? Unless all of your data is hot all of the time. But they also show you this number. The performance cost of the flash is really, really low. Right? So if you can use this for your hot data, it's incredibly valuable. Right? And if you compare this to watts, it's also very valuable. This is 10 watts to power per disk. That's 25 watts to power. Right? So there's just a remarkable uh, energy saving by using that. Now, <coughs> 
the two kind of subtle things here are with price per gig, I'm talking about consumption of static space with data, right? If I fill half of a disk with data, right, the price per gig stays the same minute to minute, right? Like I've put stuff in the tank. This price is completely dynamic, right? If you are not driving your flash to saturation, your flash is a lot more expensive than this. Right, so if you're going, oh, Flash is cheap for performance, I'm gonna buy lots of it and stick it in all my machines. Right, unless you're generating workloads that are gonna saturate it all the time, it's actually a lot more expensive. Right? And if you remember to what I was saying about our experiences with the Flash initially, it's actually hard to drive it that hard. Right? And so one of the big challenges in terms of the way that, that Flash is priced and behaved is you really want performance density. You want load on it to get value out of it. Um, the second thing is that these have not gotten faster for 10 or 20 years, right, these disks, right? In fact, they've gotten slower as a product of their size, right? So the, the bus bandwidth, the, seek, or the sequential read access, sequential read access is basically the same. The disks get bigger, right? And so doing a rebuild takes longer, right? Pulling everything off a disk takes longer, right? Which is why you get into techniques like short stroking, right? Where vendors buy small disks, they don't use the whole surface because they're trying to, you know, take advantage of the, uh, of the physics of the device. This thing is behaving a lot like CPUs did in the 90s, still, right? We're still getting process wins off of these, right? Moore's Law is kind of, you know, still having effect on these. We're getting parallelism wins off these in that we're just banking up more flash on the device. And so for both of those reasons, these flash devices, for the same money, at a one to two year time frame, are doubling in capacity and doubling in performance, right? And so if you spend on a all flash array, for five years this year, you are going to be very sad in two years. Right? When you go look at what you could have bought with that money. It makes much more sense to build a system that lets you buy the flash that you need now, use it, and add more as flash improves. <clears throat> okay, um, so that was kind of you know, the performance lesson from this thing. There's another lesson that we took as we started to play with it. And again, remember, this is all, you know, we, we haven't actually, at this point in the history of, of these insights, started to package our stuff on hardware <coughs> yet. Right? We are still um, building, right? This is still in the, the first eight months of the company. We're still building a virtual appliance-based system, right? We're still pretty committed to this, this path. And one thing that we do inside the company is we have a bunch of, uh, of guys that are really big analytics guys. Uh, we do a lot of modeling behind what we do. Um, Microsoft, uh, very, uh, uh, very um, actually generously, Microsoft Research put out uh, through SNEA uh, a few years ago a set of traces. Um, there's, there's a remarkable lack of storage traces to do system design based on uh, in the industry. Um, but Microsoft has this data center trace. It's about 14 uh, enterprise hosts. It's mixed workloads. Um, they're physical servers. They're not VMs. <coughs> Uh, there's, you know, some file servers serving up home directories, there's source control servers, web proxies, um, some uh, build servers, right, a bunch of stuff in there. Uh, it, it's, it's a very large number of disks underneath that. They all have uh, direct RAID sets that they're running on top of. And they have a trace of a week of I.O. on those things. Um, in terms of sketching these machines, these are full physical machines. They, they have lots of RAM. Um, and they are, um, it, is, it is like, quite a bit more work than you would stick on a single physical server. Um, but we use their I.O. traces as a means of sizing, you know, flash and understanding stuff. So there's this, uh, there's this algorithm uh, that you can use for this. Uh, it's this really old algorithm. It's, it's a very interesting thing. It's called Matson Stack. You can run it over a trace. And what it does is if you use an LRU, right, if you use least recently used replacement policy in a cache, right, which is a useful way of modeling a cache, uh, what Matson's will do is at the end of the trace, it will tell you what your hit rate would have been for any size of cache, right, if you were replacing an LRU. And so the way that you can think about this is this is a perfect hit ratio, right? Like one, I'm, I'm hitting everywhere I could, right? Everything is coming out of flash in this trace. This is, nothing is in flash. And this is the size of my cache. Right? And so for this entire set of VMs, what you see is that they need very little um, cash for a week's worth of work, right? They are often in the hundreds of megs, right, to small numbers of gigs of consumption, 
right, to get a quite good hit rate, and then they tail off. And so one of the side effects of this is that if you are trying to use host side resources to do caching, and you put in like a giant expensive SSD there, at the end of your SSD, right, that very expensive flash, right, the, the, the least frequently accessed bit of that flash is gonna be accessed like once a day or less, right? That is not eight cents per IOP, <laughs> right? And so again, there's, you know, the, the lesson from this is that there's a huge benefit potentially to sticking um, flash on the host. In fact, you know, it's highly likely that the chip vendors, right, the CPU vendors are gonna start just parking flash on the CPU. Right, in the same way that you've got you know, um, uh, SRAM-based processor caches, right, it's just another layer in the memory hierarchy right, that you have some very, very fast flash there, but not lots, right? just enough to balance what you need with the compute on that machine. Right? Because really, you know, your applications are doing more than just accessing flash, and all the time that they're not accessing flash, right, the flash could be doing other stuff. And so it's a delicate balance. <coughs> um, the last point on this one, is, is really to drive home the, the performance demands of this stuff, right? So, so we did a bunch of, uh, of back of the envelope uh, goal setting in terms of what we wanted to do uh, in, this, in this thing from a performance perspective, right? So this is, this is the box, right? this is our, our 2U, uh, two micro array box. So there's a server on each side of this. This is what the, uh, the guts of the thing look like. Um, there's four PCIe flash devices in this. Uh, they're those 910s that I mentioned. And we figured, you know, basically carving off a bunch of overhead for implementing the system on top of it, that we should be able to get to that 180K number when we started working with the machine. So the engineering team sat down, we said, we're gonna get to 180K. And we started grinding away at it, and you know, the performance is going up, and then we add a feature, and the performance falls off, and the performance goes up, and you know, back and forth on things. And you know, we got to this point where you know, we're getting consistently around 130,000 IOPS. And, we realized that we had sized the system early enough in our implementation that we hadn't anticipated the work in terms of building a storage system on top of it. Right? We'd sized it based on that just bare bones data path that I mentioned. Right? And as we started to implement you know, um, metadata management, right, indirection for sparseness, right, all of the stuff that you do when you build a storage system, there's a bit of compute on that path, and you're taking requests at such a ridiculously high rate in the storage system that the CPU is totally blown away, right? And so we, we went and we, we got a bunch more CPUs. We, we looked at more expensive CPUs and lo and behold, as we went to progressively more expensive CPUs in the product, right? This is the sort of like at the time cogs on the CPU, the performance just comes up, right? We aren't saturating the flash, right? <laughs> the CPU is holding us back just in terms of implementing storage and moving it from network to disk, right? And so as we came up to, you know, these kind of sweet spots, 48% improvement and we're up over 188K IOPS on the box, right? So we bought our way into it. We continue to do an enormous amount of work on the engineering side in terms of peeling away this overhead, right? Because we're terrified of the fact that the, the flash that we're trialing, right, for next year is, is twice as fast, right? We can't just go buy twice as fast a CPU to put on it. We have to like peel away more stuff. And this is, this is challenging systems engineering work. Right, from the software side. This is building a high performance router more than it's building a storage system in terms of like traditional stuff. You really worry about cache contention and data copies, right, and scheduling and just all of this stuff. Okay, so that's a bit of a long winded background on stuff, but I, you know, I, I can't really emphasize enough the, the challenges that you face in, in dealing with this really fast flash and this is what we have over the next few years, right? This stuff is really just the tip of the iceberg, right? The PCIe bus is the thing that has changed a lot. The flash moving onto that bus, right? And increasingly onto the memory bus, right? Not flash itself. And so this is kind of how I think about flash, <laughs> right? It's, it, it is this like really, really difficult to manage thing. And you really have to be cautious with how you architect it, right? Don't do this. <laughs> um, and now, so stepping back from stuff, right, there's, there's one extra little bit of data that's interesting to kind of reason about. Um, flash guys are, you know, especially people who build systems based on Flash and stuff, there's just been this huge chunk of language around latency, right? I strongly encourage you to go get systems that have great responsive latency, 
But before you do it, I strongly encourage you to go think about your application workloads and run them over small trial versions of those systems and see how much you really depend on that latency. Right? Because one thing that is really important about Flash is that virtualization has created this IO blender that disks absolutely suck at. And so as a virtualization admin that's worked on top of disk systems, disk-based systems, you know, you're used to users getting really hacked off because they're getting seconds and tens of seconds of latency. It's very easy to drive a disk-based array into that. And Flash doesn't have that problem, and so Flash is a big win this way. But that next jump that says, oh man, I gotta get, I gotta get something in the neighborhood of 100 microseconds latency instead of 200 microseconds. It's, like, you very quickly eliminate the long pole by carving latency off Flash and something else in your system ends up being a problem, right? Whether it is the latency on the network between your server and the client that's 200 milliseconds away over the web, right? Or the CPU on the machine competing with other CPUs, right? It's, it's a whole system thing. And so thinking about the latencies that you see with Flash, just <coughs> in terms of the language that, that you hear around whether or not it even makes sense to do network attached storage anymore, right? A flash device, a PCIe flash device, the 910, right, with only one request outstanding at a time, right, so eliminating any kind of delay in terms of talking to the device will respond to a request in around 100 microseconds. And you will get around 6,000 or 7,000 IOPS off that device when you do that, right, because the device needs to be doing a lot of work to give you the IOPS, right, it needs pipelining. And so if you give it 32 requests at a time, right, it will do this device, 134,000 IOPS, but now you're up into the 200 something microseconds delay, right? As a point of reference, right, a round trip from user space to user space on TCP, right, over that switch is 40 microseconds, right? So the network attach aspect of Flash is for the vast majority of applications not the thing that you need to be optimizing out of your system. Right? And it makes a heck of a lot more sense to be getting performance density and driving the workloads to it than trying to figure out you know, how to move that thing close to your system. We're going to take a whole bunch of management pain in terms of you know, the lifetime suddenly of your server being the same as the lifetime of your flash and trying to exactly match your VM workloads to what your flash can, can sustain. So yeah, I think the, the, I'm just trying to say is basically you don't have to go after the best of the fastest, go after what's right for your workload because this is basically saying you get most of the Twenty times the performance by having a larger queue depth and twice the latency. All in two hundred thirty-five microseconds, is still insanely awesome. <laughs> yeah. Is that a word? Is that a phrase? So it is now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the official measure of the tweet that. Is insanely <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, I mean, c who cares at that at that point, right? I mean, maybe yeah, for some like high volume trading kind of stuff. But I totally agree. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying with all this stuff, is that you know, at the device level, right, the, the, uh, the machinations that happen around how high performance this stuff is, right, most of your overhead on this is the software layers above it anyways. Right? It's your apps and it's the file system code underneath it. Moving this stuff out onto the network right, at the cost of tens of microseconds or even hundreds of microseconds of network latency is not really going to slow it down. Right. right? So it's, it's really just that point that I'm making. right? Yeah, there's a lot of layers of performance in between. I mean, just the hypervisor layer on top of that, and like I said, yeah. buried underneath it, if your software can't fully utilize that yeah. thread correctly, yeah, I mean, this is raw physics. This is, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> so this is, These this are undeniable and undisputable, you know, physical things that we're bound to. That's right. That's electrons, but <laughs> the, the layers above that is where things go sideways. And, and, and these, again, like everything that I've talked about here, these are just device metrics, right? This is not me measuring our system or anybody's system, right? This is just wrapping your head around what, what this gear is capable of. Right, because there's so much, where should we put the flash, how should we build our systems, you know, going on right now that I think it's, it's very helpful to understand what the building blocks you're using can, <coughs> do, can do, okay? Um, and so, you know, th th this is kind of where we, where we end up, right? The, the, the demands of this stuff in response to you know, all the stuff that I've kind of gone through are that, first of all, it makes a lot of sense to keep storage separate, right? It makes a lot of sense, especially on top of Flash, to build Flash in a way that you can scale out in response to pricing, right? In response to the availability year on year and really drive workloads too, right? Really try and exercise all the time, right? So you should be deploying performance in response to your performance needs. And that also, 
in building a system based on this flash, you need a bunch of CPU to really take advantage of it, and you need a bunch of network to expose it, right? The lesson that we got from those fusion cards at the beginning was once we did peel away the layers and drive them at full rate, right, one card saturated one 10 gig port. So buying a second card and sticking it next to that first card and rating it up was not a good idea, <laughs> right? Because you're leaving performance on the table, right? You can't, you're choked, right? And this is the fundamental problem with this flash that you really have to work to expose its potential, right? All right. Andy, um, can I ask you a question about yeah. the Q depth on the last slide? You had a yes. Q depth of 32. So is that a limiting factor or what happens when you increase it higher? Is there any benefit or how, how much of a- Super good question. It, 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 it depends entirely on the, uh, on the device. Uh, for this device, I picked 32 because it tapered off after 32. Right, so it depends on, it, it, basically there's a queue exposed, the device pulls stuff off the queue, and internally there's parallelism going on. And so to saturate the device side pipeline, it will vary device to device. Right. right. Um, yeah. so.